So um, when I was preparing the message, I first want to thank God for just the way that he is and how wonderful he is and how he's melting our hearts into one. We are truly recipients of the grace of God and of the person of God. So I just want to thank Mark and thank Jen and for inviting me and having me here. Um, we, uh, we got an opportunity to uh, um, speak before the conference and I asked Pastor Mark, uh, what, what is it? I, I had some material prepared and uh, God says, nobody likes canned food. <laughs> Did you ever get to a restaurant? They say, you know, you, that, you, know you, you want a fruit plate and when they bring it to you, you can just tell that those saggy old, you know, you're going, this, is this canned or is this fresh? And then you taste it and it's got that metal taste from inside the can. And you're going, oh, Lord. So the father said, I, I want something fresh for my people. This is about my children. And there's going to be needs that they're going to have. And so I want you to get something fresh. So um, I remember giving a uh, pastor a call. And, and then he said something about more and more grace and more grace and more grace. And so I sat down and, and I asked God, what did he want me to teach? And he said, listen, grace is a person and his name is Jesus. Grace is a person, and his name is Jesus. And I went, God, that's an amazing title. Now could you fill the rest of it in? So, and so he did, he did. And I want to give a shout out to my son, who, um, who's a theologian. And um, it's, it's interesting. He goes, Dad, and I love this. You know, he's just standing in front of me. He goes, you know, you have to steward the word properly. He says, you need to be a good steward of God's word. And I'm sitting there going, yes, sir, yes, sir. And so he, he took the scriptures I was using and he broke them apart and gave me points for each piece. And, and then the Holy Spirit filled it all in, you know. So I just want to give a shout out that, you know, it's great when you have a son that sees the love of God in you and then decides, Dad, I want to do what you're doing. Um, but, but I'm going to kick that integrity thing because we got to protect we got to protect the word, and I thought that that was good. So um, a shout out to my son Daniel, and I, I just appreciate him. Um, as I was sitting there and I was asking God about more and more, and God says, I give you more and more. And this wasn't even part of my message, and I said, okay, what do you give us more and more? He goes, go to Psalms 115, 14 through 15. I love this, and, and God said, I'm just going to show you that I am the God of more and more. And so uh, I'm reading out of, what is this? I don't even know. King James Version. Psalms 115, 14 through 15. And it says, the Lord. I love this. I'm going to tell you why I love this when it starts out with the Lord. See, really in the Old Testament, the, the word Lord was really the, a word that we've changed. But if you look at the original, any time that they were talking about Lord, they were talking about Jehovah. So it's Jehovah. So what makes him Lord? You do. You make him Lord. When it said that he was Jehovah Rapha, you know who gave him that name? God did not give himself that name. The people gave God that name. And so it's so important that, that when you begin to hear about the names of God, know that those are the names that we are supposed to know God by. A lot of us, and I shared this earlier with couple of the pastors, but a lot of us are in the believing realm, but really the believing realm, to be honest with you, is supposed to be a step into the knowing realm. And when you know God, I, someone told me, when you pray for people, pastor, how do you have such confidence? I said, I know the one who made the promise. If it was about me, I'd be trembling, but I know him. And then I know his love for the person that I'm praying for. Amen. Nothing makes God more giddy than a person receiving something that he purchased. Just makes God giddy. And so look at what the word tells us here. It says, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Amen. I love that. He's not only gonna increase you, but he's gonna increase you and your children more and more. I know my kids must be jumping up and down right now. 
they're going, all right, daddy's going to increase us. It, it says the Lord, but you know, they're going to interpret that different. Ye are blessed of the Lord, which, which made heaven and earth. So God is going to bless us and increase us more and more. By what he does? No, by us allowing him to reveal himself in us. That's the way he does it, folks. God is resting. Everything that he does for you today, he does it on the finished work of the cross. Everything, every promise that you ever needed answered is at the cross. And because it's the finished work, it really is the outpouring of grace. If you think about this, sin came because they ate from a tree. How did sin end? On two parts of a tree. The same way that sin came in, it exited the world. And here's the beautiful part about that. Now sin can no longer separate you from the Father because the new covenant is not between us and God, it's between God and Christ. And we are beneficiaries of that covenant. Isn't he awesome? He said, I'm going to make it so foolproof that my, my creation will never, ever suffer again. And he does that by giving us something, and that is the outpouring of his grace. And when I realize what is God's grace, it's Jesus. That is the evidence that you have of God's grace. Did you know that in the Old Testament, they had God's grace here and there, but the new grace was greater than the old grace because the new grace is an everlasting grace and it's never leaving because his name is Jesus. And so I want to read from the book of John, chapter 1, verse 14 through 17, familiar passage to those that understand the grace of God. Thank you for sharing with us that that grace comes through the faith that works together, grace and faith working together to accomplish in us and making us well-rounded as children of God. And then thank you that that, that that grace and that faith is the faith and the grace of God through us. It really is. Because all the people that came up and received their healing, it wasn't me. It was Christ in me, the hope of glory. That, it was that grace, the one that heals. Amen? Amen. So 1 John 14, 17 tells us, the world, or the word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I love that. I love that. Because if you're not speaking, you're not creating. You realize that when you speak, you literally create? Did you know that? You know, the Father breathed on Adam, and Adam gave life. Right? He was full of life or he received life from the Father. That life was a spirit, and that spirit came in and gave him life. So when you're speaking, you are creating. I was in a prison ministry, and one guy said to me, I don't believe that. I said, all right, go and tell the, the guy that's mostly built up in the prison that he's ugly and he looks stupid. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I said, you see, your words do have power. They have power in the positive, and they have power in the negative. The power of life and death is where? The power of the tongue. Right. But when the tongue does what? Speak out the word. When you're speaking, you're creating. So in the beginning, the, wor the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So Christ was not living in anyone at that point. He was living among them. I want to make you very aware of something because I once said to the Lord, I would have loved to live when Jesus walked and just watch him love and have compassion on people. And the Lord answered me something. I'll share it with you in a minute. It says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of what? Grace, Grace and truth. truth. Grace and and truth. Jesus was the incarnation of the truth of God. And he was also the grace of God. 
And so when Jesus first came down, and, I, and I, that's what I said to him, I would have loved to be there. He says, Alex, you've got one better. I go, what? He says, I don't walk among you now, I walk in you. Amen. And I went, whoa. He said, it's cool to watch somebody else do it, but it's cool when I do it through you. I said, that's right. You know, I'd love to shoot a basket like Michael Jordan, but I'll be honest with you people, I'll hit everything but the basket. And if I hit the basket, it'd be a miracle. Either the wind blew the ball in or something happened. But it definitely wouldn't be because I had the skill set. But if Michael Jordan can unzip himself and I can get in his body and he could zip himself back up, I can shoot that ball exactly how Michael Jordan did it. You know when Christ wanted to empower you what he did? He unzipped himself and according to the word of God, we are in Christ Jesus. So now he doesn't dwell among us, we dwell within him. And when he zippered back up, that's why. If you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's why the same grace that Christ had now dwells in you. You are literally a representation of God in Christ Jesus, full of grace and love. See, the difference between Christianity and every other religion is that your God lives inside of you. Amen. You are walking around representations and actual beings, you're part of his being. Christ is the head, we are the church, and we're actually part of his body. So the same power that was in Christ Jesus lives in you. The question is, do you see yourself with or without that power? When I was seeking healing from a disease that would kill me, separated my eyes, I cried out to God to heal me for a year. Nothing happened. And I said, God, when I get to heaven and I look at you in the eyes, I'm going to tell you that you can't accuse me of not believing your word. I knew every verse on healing. Guys, I had them all memorized. I had the verses memorized. I forgot about the healer. But I had the, you know what I mean? Let's just be real now. If we're going to be real. I'm going to take off the guard. Sometimes we got the, we, we, we got, you know why? Because we, we want to know we got the formula, but we forgot to get the person of Christ. And so I remember begging him to heal me. And, and, and I remember when he finally spoke to me and he said, I cannot heal you. I felt so good because at least he was speaking back to me. And then he said, go ahead and read 1 Peter 2.24, that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. And I remember he told me, hold an item, and I did. He said, ask me for the item. I said, why if I already have it? He goes, exactly. Stop telling me about the bigness of your disease and start telling your disease about the bigness of me. Last time I asked God to heal anyone, because now I understood he's already healed. You all sitting in chairs that were already made. You're able to rest in those chairs. If they weren't already made, you wouldn't be able to rest in them. And God says, that's why I ask you to come into the rest. Why are you laboring? So I ask him, well, Father, if I'm healed, then why do I have these symptoms? He goes, why do you? <laughs> Oops. You have no business being sick. So you know what I did? Instead of, again, praying to God, I started speaking to my body and said, sickness, you need to go. Amen. You have crossed the line on a body that's already been healed. Amen. And you know what it says when the enemy is found out, he has to what? Flee. Flee. Now there's another enemy that you guys don't understand, and that enemy is the enemy that doesn't let you know that you are not only the recipients of grace, you are the recipients of the person of grace. His name is Jesus Christ, and you live in him. He unzipped himself and took in everybody who would welcome him. And we are literally in a position in Christ Jesus, sitting in heavenly places. Isn't that amazing? All of us are individuals here sharing the same air in the room, sharing the same building, but we're all individuals. Isn't that amazing? And just like we see ourselves 
as individuals in this room, we're all the same in Christ Jesus. I look at each one of you and I see Jesus. I see him in you. I see him in you from here. I can look at you and I can see from here which ones of you need Christ and which ones of you already have him. Because I could see Christ in you. But our hope is a hope that's against the hope sometimes of the law in the Old Testament. God gave me a, 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 a revelation um, this year that blew me away. He said, Alex, there was only two times that I said to someone, you have great faith. He goes, you want to know what the power of that was? He says, neither of them were Jews. He goes, did you know that you can't approach me from the law standpoint? Because you're not a Jew. You didn't get grafted in under law. You got grafted in under grace. The law did not graft you in. Grace graft, grafted you in. It says that he came to his own and his own did what? They rejected him. So what did he do? He said, all right, I'm going to the Gentiles. Why? Because we understood that we didn't have a right. Were you ever somewhere? I mean, I've been in meetings where they're handing out bottles of water and they'll walk by me and hand me one and I know I wasn't supposed to have one. I get all happy because I got something out of grace that I know didn't belong to me. I wasn't one of the speakers there or any. No, I got it out of grace. And I get so happy. And God says, you know what your happiness is? That I came to my children, the Jews, and even though salvation still stands in the house of Israel, you came in grafted by grace. Amen. And he says, so let me tell you the advantage that you have that your Jewish brothers and sisters don't have. You get to believe me without no hangups. As a matter of fact, he told me, the more you understand my authority, you'll understand why the centurion soldier understood. I love the centurion soldier. I'll be honest with you. If I could have been someone in those days, it wasn't anyone but the centurion soldier. Because when he walked up to Jesus, he says, I know how this works because I am a man under authority. You know what the centurion soldier had heard about Jesus? That Jesus would say, I don't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. As a matter of fact, I don't speak unless I've seen my father do it or my father tells me to do it. That centurion soldier understood Jesus is under authority. So guess what? If me obeying and being under authority works, then it must be working for Jesus as well. And you know what? I don't have to do the job that my foot soldiers do. I tell them to do it. So if my servant needs healing, I know that Jesus doesn't have to go. He has the commanding power to just send the word. And when he approached Jesus, he said, look, I'm not even worthy for you to step on it. But if you send the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus is like, wow. You know what kind of faith you guys get to have? You get to have the wow. As long as you acknowledge him, not only as Savior, but as Lord. When you do, that grace that's already in you begins to flow. Begins to flow. Amen? Amen. So, grace is a person, and that person is Jesus. So he no longer dwells among us, he dwells in us. Ah, oh, what a privilege. No matter where you go, you take them. No matter what it is, you take them. My sister recently called me up. She says, uh, bro, there's a, a friend of mine. She's, it's bad. It's just bad. It's just bad. Could you come to the hospital? We went. They had so many tubes coming out of this lady. Her body was swollen. Um, and we prayed. But see, I, you need to understand something. When you pray for someone, you're really not praying. You're commanding. Because you know what prayer does? It leaves room for doubt. And I hope this works, Father, in Jesus' name. You know what I mean? But when you pray because you know him, That's and right. you know that he died on the cross. There used to be a commercial a long time ago, and it was directed at the African-American community, and it said a, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Well, guess what? What the cross did for us is a terrible thing to waste. Why are you in poverty? Why are you hurting? Why are you sick? When Christ said, I became poor so you would be rich, and all of your infirmities, I carried them on the cross. Why the double payment? 
No need. He already paid for it at the cross. Give it over to him. Do it by releasing it and giving it over to him. Why? Because if you think about it, if we're in Christ and in Christ there is no sickness, there, sh there should be no sickness in your body. So stop telling God about it and tell the sickness, get out. You need to leave. So sorry. You're going to have to vacate. Yeah, you and your cousins all get out. You, you all need to leave <laughs> right now. Anyway, this lady, praise the living God. Um, we prayed, and I'll be honest with you. We prayed, and I prayed in faith. And I know that we transmitted the healing and power of God. But I went. My sister called me. She said, you got to come. It was two weeks later. I came. This woman was sitting up. And I said, you are not the same lady that we seen with all those tubes attached at the hospital. She goes, I don't even remember that. I said, all I remember is when the presence of God came, you started crying. Even though she was in a, in a coma state, her tears started coming out of her eyes. Listen, people, the, a body knows when it's, it's, it's been confronted with the resurrection power of the blood of Jesus. It knows, and it will respond. Amen? So he now dwells at that... That, that Jesus was full of grace and truth, now lives in us. He's no longer separated from us. There is no distance. There is no distance between us and our Creator, no longer. Why? Because He is spirit. And what is spirit is invisible. And what is invisible can go through walls. What's invisible can transcend time. What's invisible is not held to the time or the elements of this world. God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. You know when my puny little peanut brain couldn't comprehend that? That's when he had to tell me, Alex, oxygen is throughout the entire earth. Okay, okay. So how could oxygen that I created be everywhere and I not be everywhere? I'm above my creation. I'm outside of my creation. I went, whoa. You know what I love? That if you will just be honest that you're ignorant, he'll be honest and teach you right out of your ignorance. Yeah, because my people perish from a lack of knowledge. And you know what's crazy? That Christ is the knowledge revealed. That's what he would tell the disciples. He would tell the disciples all the time this. He would say, they would ask him, why did you teach in parables? He goes, because it's for you to know. It's for you to know. It's for you to know. That's for everybody right now sitting here. It's for you to know. Why? Because you're part of the body. Could you imagine if my leg didn't know what to do and started to walk off on its own? You guys would be pretty freaked out. Well, he's standing there, but his leg just took off. As the body, the beautiful thing is, is that we know why. Because we, we're constantly in communication with our head. Jesus, everything he did, he would check with the Father. He would check with the Father. He would check with the Father constantly. The only time that he publicly talked to the Father in front of people was when he was raising someone from the dead. And the only reason that he did it was so that we would know how it works. He goes, Lord, this ain't for my benefit. I know you, Dad. But this is for their benefit so that they will know. And then did he say, God, go ahead and raise Lazarus. I'll stand right here. No, he didn't. Right? He said, I'm going to show them how it works. You command the death to leave, and you command life. So that we would know how to do it. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. So this is what we need to walk in every single day. Why? Because the God, who's full of grace and truth, came in the form of man. It just boggles my mind that the Creator became the creation to show you His love. That's commitment. That's commitment. You know something? There's a show today that you guys can see. It's called Undercover Boss. What does the boss do undercover? He shaves, right? Or if she, right, she puts on, fixes her hair differently. And what does she become? One of their workers. And what happens in the midst of them becoming one of their workers? Now, this isn't a promo for, for the show, okay? But what happens? I mean, I've seen one episode where, where the man just broke down crying, hugged the employee, took off the fake hair and said, listen, I'm the CEO. I'm changing this right now. I, I can't wait till this show's over to tell you, for you to know, I, I got to fix this now. 
Guys, God did not know what it was to be under the influence of sin. I know we think God knows it all. God did not know what it was to be under the influence of sin. And if we want to talk about the law, you know what the law was supposed to be? A schoolmaster so that you knew you couldn't make it without him. But guess what God did not understand? And I'm telling you this because God could never be put under the influence of sin. As a matter of fact, it says that Christ was tempted in everything so he can do what? He can tell the Father, I'm in, you know why Christ is interceding for you? Because he knows what it's like to be tempted, but without sin. He understands. He came down, the Creator, became His creation so He can identify with you to do what? To give you a life of victory. That's love. That's love. That He would do that. That He would take off His robe and become God in the flesh so He can identify with you. Please don't let the devil tell you that God doesn't know what you're going through. Please. Don't ever be convinced of that. Because a God that would do that would only do that for one reason. And that reason is that he loves you. I spoke to a good friend of mine, Pastor Gregory Dick, how recently he was just at a grace conference. And he told me, Alex, you know what I taught on? That love is the why of grace. And truly, God poured out his grace because he loves you. He is so in love with you. He is so in love with you. And sometimes we go, well, if God loves me, why am I going through this? Why would a God that loves me allow me to go through this? You guys seen God demonstrate here his healing over and over. Yet I have two boys at home that were both diagnosed with autism. During their vaccine, when they were giving them their vaccines, Two of my boys got poisoned. Now, if you're wondering, how does this man operate in the healing power of God so strongly, and yet at home he's got the situation going on? I'm going to tell you why. Love. Love. I know him. I know my Heavenly Father, and I know that he's full of love. I'll tell you what, though, my experiences that allowed me to understand the compassion that Christ had. Because if it kills, if it destroys, and if it steals from you, it's the devil. And if you get to the point where you no longer blame God, because you don't have a bipolar God, okay? He doesn't inflict sickness on you to then heal you. All right? That's not who he is. Some of us, were, we've blamed him. And we have to forgive our misunderstanding that it wasn't him. But then you're going, well, if he's merciful, why does he allow it? Because he's merciful. He gave us the authority. He gave us the authority. That's what he did. Think about it. The angel came to Cornelius, but the angel could not lead him to Christ. Why? Because that authority is not given to angels. He had to go and convince Peter. He goes, oh man, Peter ain't going under no house of no Gentile. So what does he have to do? He has to send a white, three times, has to send out a white blanket and tell him, kill and eat the stuff that's dirt. And Peter's like, oh no, you know, Peter, he was, I love Peter. I mean, what a character. That's why I know there's mercy for me because every time I read about Peter, I go, there's mercy for me. But when you think about it, the mercy of God flows but it needs us. It needs your feet. It needs your hands. It needs your heart. The people around you need you to be that light to them. Why? Because you're full of grace. You're full of truth. You're full of mercy. You're full of God. Matter of fact, I could just tell you right now, you guys are full of it. That's all I got to say. You're full of it. So it tells us in verse 16, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one that I spoke to you about. When he said this, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Why? 
because he was before him in the invisible. You gotta understand something. Your power rests on power that's invisible. Now we know, and, and we were quoted today, if you guys were here earlier, we were quoted um, Hebrews 11, that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. You know what, I, I know my mama loves me. I can't see it right now, but I know that she loves me. I know my God loves me. I can't see it right now, but I know that he loves me. Why? Because there's more power in the invisible than there is in the visible. That's why when what you see with your natural eye, if it contradicts what you know in your heart about your heavenly father, you have to allow what you know about your heavenly father to override what you see with your natural eye. And I will tell you this, the more you understand that you're not a body, because the life of a man is in his spirit, when you realize that you're a spirit and your heavenly father is a spirit, and those that worship him in spirit and in truth experience him, you realize there's more power. But what do you do with that, with that power that's in you? You put words to it, and then that word becomes flesh. So the things that are seen are created out of things that were unseen. It's not that they weren't there. It's just that they're there in the spirit realm. But when you speak them, you bring them into the physical realm. You know, when GM makes a new car, before they sell that car, they send parts to all the dealers. Do you know why? So when the car breaks down, the dealer already has most of the parts it could break down. Guess what God did before he created you all? He created some spare parts. He did. So when he created you, in case something broke down, you know what he does? If you speak it, it comes into existence. That's how it works. That's how you operate in the love of God. You're just like Christ. I mean, you didn't get a junior Holy Spirit when he saved you. He put the entire Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you. When you get up in the morning, you got to know, man, I'm packed with power. I'm packed with power. The power to love because I'm loved. The power to heal because I'm healed. The power to be a witness because a witnesser lives inside of me. This is how it works. And you know what, guys? There is no striving in this. This is effortless change because you just constantly allow your mind to be renewed to know what's the good, the perfect, and the acceptable will of God. And what is that? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. God is not outside of you. He's within you. And you are inside of him. It works. It works. But you know what happens? Sometimes we've just never tried it. When you speak, the word is invisible, right? Do you guys see my words? No. You hear the sound waves that are being made, but you don't see my words because there's more power, again, in the invisible. That's what I love. I know that I'm sitting right inside of Christ, even though I can't see him. But you know who can see him? Other people. Other people know. And they'll look around and, no, no, don't know. Something's different about you. What is it? I get that a lot. Something, what's up with something's? Can't quite put my finger on it, but something's different about you. And that's what, you know what it is? It's the love of God in me for you. That's what it is. God so loved you that he sent me. Isn't that awesome? Because he already sent Christ, so now he sends me to be what? God's feet, God's heart. God's heart, God's heart. You should always allow God to express his compassion through your heart. And I'm going to tell you something. And one of the books over there has a title that, you know, the problem with depression is that you're only self-aware. When you become other aware, aware of other people, not what you're going through, but what other people are going through, all of a sudden the love of God will begin to pour out of you. The gift that God has given you is not for you. It's for others. It's always for others. Christ came not for himself. He came for others. He came for us. And so now we get to come for others. I mean, this is awesome. We do not live separate from Christ. We are the representation of Christ today for other people. And they will believe God by what you demonstrate 
The Bible says that we are open books today that people can read. They can walk around you and go, wow, man, that chapter was good this morning. You know, hallelujah. Why? Because it's, it's the way that God expresses himself through you as an individual. He gave us different fingerprints. We're all individuals grouped together in one body called the body of Christ. Praise his name. Praise God. So in verse 16, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is the NIV. And so when I looked this up, my theologian son said to me, he goes, Dad, if people would understand, grace wasn't given now. Grace was given in the Old Testament. You can find it everywhere. And I started to do a, a hunt. Where was grace in the Old Testament? You know that grace in the Old Testament was given, but most of the time grace was requested. And here's, and if you look up this, 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 just these words like this in the Old Testament, you'll find it time and time over again. If I have found favor in your sight. If I have found favor in your sight. Today, favor found us. But in the Old Testament, they had to locate favor. We found the favor of God. It is the grace of God. And guess what? It is ours now. Because that favor and that grace empowers you to be all that you can be in Christ. So it's not only the favor of God, grace, but it's also the empowerment to operate within that grace. Did you ever see somebody that you just have a grace to do something? And that's the first thing that comes out of you. Man, you got such a grace for that. You know what that is? That is an empowerment of God's favor in that area for them. So that you understand that that's how grace operates today. Before it was requested, now it's been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, I'm thinking, this God, how he loves us. How he loves us so much that he would say, let me give you this grace. Let me empower you. I not only wanted to save you, I wanted to restore you back to where we were in this relationship before Adam and Eve sinned. But I wanted to break the back of sin so it could no longer separate you from me ever again. Amen. Folks, I'm, I'm going to mess up your theology, but if you're faithless, the Bible says he will remain faithful. Listen, God is committed to you. God is committed to you. And if you can live a life that loves him back for the way that he loved you, you've won. Yeah. When Satan offers me sin, I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Really? Compared to what Christ did for me, really? That momentary pleasure for a, a lifelong of pleasure with my father, really? You know, you want to be like Coke. You want to be drinking the real thing. I don't want to offend any Pepsi lovers, okay? But I'm just saying, once you drink the real thing, you know, you know, you know. Nobody here wants canned fruit. You want fresh fruit, right? So once you've tasted that, you won't go back to those things. Because once you've tasted of how much he loves you, you will no longer beg him to heal you. You'll say, Daddy, I know you're healing me because I'm your favorite. I know my picture is on, I know it's in a big magnet right there on your refrigerator, you know. I know you carry my picture in your wallet. Why? Because I know that you are in love with me. How am I convinced that God is in love with me? Because of the payment that he was willing to pay. If that, you know, if you guys found out that I paid a million dollars for this phone, most of you want to find out what kind of phone cost a million dollars or what, why would... Pastor Alex pay a million dollars for this phone. Well, guess why? Because I found it that valuable. The phone didn't have that value. I gave it that value by what I paid for it. What gives you your value is what the Father was willing to pay for you. Don't tell me you're not valuable to God. Don't tell me when he hung his only son on the cross that he did not bankrupt heaven for you. You are the most valuable person 
before the Father. And I'm going to tell you something. If it was just for one, he would have hung Christ because that's what he did. Remember the conversation he had with the serpent? He said to the serpent, you know what? Because of what you've done, you're going to crawl on that belly of yours for the rest of your life. And then he said, and I would put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And you will bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Who bruised the head of Satan? And who did Satan bruise his heel? Jesus Christ. Already God had made up his mind. If it's just for these two, I'm going to do it. Amen. I'm going to do it. Don't tell me you don't have value when he bankrupt heaven to purchase you. I mean, that's love. That's a love that, that, that can't even be touched. That's how much he loves you. And then you got an earache or you got a pain somewhere or you need a ligament to grow or something, and he's not going to do that when he already bankrupt heaven for you? And you need to read the word. He said, if he gave you Christ, what else will he hold back from you? Nothing. But then he went beyond that and he filled you with grace and truth and made you a part of the body of Christ. You guys give the devil a headache when you get up in the morning and go, so not them again. Keep all the sinners away from them. These people shine. And you think, oh, they're going to think I'm weird if I just let them know about my faith. No, they're in need of the faith that you have. Amen? Amen? I had a friend, he goes, Alex, I just have a hard time at work because I'm the only Christian. I said, oh, poor thing. What happens? Oh, they're cursing and they're swearing and I don't even know where to put my plate during. Oh, you poor thing. I'm this little and there are all these sinners around me. And I said to him, well, according to Scripture, let me tell you who you are. It says that you're the light of the world. Amen. You represent the light. I said, now let me tell you, you see yourself as a little Christian with all those sinners, but if I were to take a small candle and make this room completely dark, wherever I took that candle, what would darkness have to do? It had to back off. I go, so you're telling me a little tiny four-inch candle can move darkness, but you, filled with the power and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, can't tell the darkness around you where to go. I said, your problem is perspective. You don't know who you are in Christ. And guess how we get knowledge? We get it the same way we get faith. How do we get faith? By hearing the Word of God. That's how you get knowledge of God. And as you get knowledge and you get faith and you get grace, and then you get filled with this wonderful thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, get ready. Do you know how time touches that that doesn't have time? It's during your time of praying in the Holy Spirit. That's right. Did you know that when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it's not a one-directional? It's a two-directional language? It's like a Cuban family. Everybody talks at the same time. <laughs> I know, I got a lot of Cuban friends. I don't know who, how did you hear it? She was, uh, you were both talking at the same time. But I'm Hispanic, so I can crack Hispanic jokes. But all that I'm saying is that it's a bi-directional language, literally from time, your words in the Spirit reach the Spirit of God who is outside of time, and there's a transfer. It's called God speed. God can do more in a few moments of you praying in the Holy Ghost than you saying an entire prayer in the language you understand. Because God is a Spirit, and it's Spirit-to-Spirit -spirit communication. Spirit to spirit. When I was standing there worshiping the Lord today, I noticed he said, go into the spirit for a moment. Why? Because he wanted to heal those knees and he wanted to heal those ears. And so, you know what I love about being used by God? That I, I recognize the value that he's put in me. And it's the same value he's put in each one of you. So when you actually are doing something for God, the value that he's put in you, that value of grace and truth, it just, just shines and it just comes out. Amen? Amen? So I love this because if you want to understand about the grace in the Old Testament, the next verse tells us what it is. It says, For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So the law, the old grace, came through Moses, but the new grace came through Jesus Christ. And what I love about the new grace, it's not limited to your obedience. It was limited to Christ's obedience. And when Christ obeyed, when Christ obeyed, when he went up there and he said, Dad, if this cup can be taken from me, because he knew he already had a, 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 an understanding of what he was going to suffer. And then he went back again. And he said, Father, if this cup can be taken from me. But the third time that he went, he went to surrender. And he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Right. What are we? We are the fulfillment of God through Christ obeying at the cross Amen. and so now we know the truth yeah but brother you don't understand I have cancer yeah but brother you don't understand that the blood healed the cancer I'm not denying you have an illness I'm just denying it's right to stay because there's one that came to remove it that has greater power than the illness I'm not denying that you're de under depression but I'm not but I'm not also denying that Jesus can deliver you from the depression because all you need to do is understand how much you're loved and then begin to reflect that love to others. I have never seen a person stay under depression who understood how much God loved them and then started loving others. It's amazing. It's amazing because that truth, that grace begins to flow through you. I don't have to be convinced of who Jesus is. I get to live him in me every day. That's the way that God is. We get to walk this out. We get to live this out. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know, grace in the Old Testament cost you your obedience. Grace in the New Testament cost Christ his obedience. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when Pastor Mark shared and he was talking about, you know, I, I would try to hit the quote status quo on what it was to have this life of victory, but nobody knew what it was. Was it an hour of prayer? Did I have to read the Bible a certain amount of it? Well, you know, what was the status quo that I had to hit in order to live this? That status quo, his name is Jesus, and he hit it for you, and all you had to do is live. You live in it. You get to live in it. You get to bathe in it. The truth and the grace of God every single day. And you know what? You can't earn it. I remember one time I was struggling to live holy, and God said, Alex, do you think that it's your holiness that did this for you, or do you think it was Christ's holiness? So let me take you to a little verse here. It says, none were, right, were righteous, no, not one. Stop trying to get righteous. Stop trying to get righteous. You know, you guys don't get up in the morning and go, today I'm going to be a man. I'm just going to be a man. It's my goal today. I'm going to work at being a man. I'm going to roll up my shirt. I'm going to work hard because I'm going to work at being a man. You don't get up and do that. But you know how many people get up, today I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm going to work at being a Christian. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to be good to my enemies. Maybe tomorrow I won't be, but today I'm going to be good because I'm going to be a good Christian. And a Christian is not something you do. A Christian is something that you are. Yes. It's what you are. That's right. You ooze out. If people squeeze you, Christ comes out. That's right. Amen? That's, right. That's the way it should be. And then you know what? Then they'll know that you are a child of the living God. But you are again, where? In Christ. Empowered to do everything that Christ did. That's right. And live that life just like Christ lived it. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Father. So here's Jesus, the expression of the grace of God for the purpose of bringing his creation back into the same relationship that they used to have. I imagine the father running through the garden. Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why, why, why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. And the next question is the most powerful question that I think God is still asking today. Who told you? 
What other voice besides mine were you listening to? When I'm praying for people and if, I, and if God tells me this one's full of fear and I'll say, you're full of fear, all you're doing is you're listening to another voice. Who told you that you were going to die from that illness? Who told you? Who? Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside your body. So what voice have you given greater power to because it's got your attention? That voice and the only voice that should have your attention is the Holy Spirit. Amen? And man, when the devil knows too, because he talked to you and you're just ignoring him. Because see, Satan can't do nothing to you until you confess it. Because he's been stripped of all authority. The only authority he can get is the one you give him. And it's usually the authority right after prayer. There are people that pray, and, and if they start telling me about the problem after the prayer, I know they, yeah, but Pastor Alex, can we cover this? And can we cover this? No, we can't. The blood covered that. What we can do is receive what was already covered. Amen. If you see yourself without healing and with sickness, you will be sick. But if you see yourself without the sickness and with the healing, guess what? Satan lost. I was going to pray for a woman, massive growth in her ovaries. They were going to do this crazy operation, try to cut it all out. I went to pray and the Holy Spirit stopped me. And here's what he said. She sees herself as sick without the healing. So she is requesting healing from me. And I can't answer that prayer because I already did it. And so I said to her, I said, sweetheart, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as sick with, without the healing or with the healing and without the sickness? She says, no, I see myself as sick seeking healing. And I appreciate her telling me that. I said, well, why do you seek what you have? See, sometimes... You know, I, I, and again, I grew up in the church, so I'm used to, you know, one of these days, God is going to do a great revival. God is going to do. God is going to do. God is going to do. And I remember one time God, God said to me, you know what I'm going to do? What I've already done. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reveal to you what I've already done because I am sitting down after I created. I am resting on my work and my work is good as finished. And, it, and you guess what? I'm telling you, if we can rest on the finished work of Christ, we will stop trying to get God to do something for us. You know what faith is? Faith is, you know, if God were expressing his faith today on the earth and it was a man with no eyes, God would hand them a book and as he would attempt to read, eyes would form. That's faith. That's God's faith. Eyes would form as a person would attempt to read the book. I was in Mexico. I prayed for a blind man. He was already much older. I prayed for him, and it was the first time that God healed somebody from blind, blindness. It's funny because Don was there with me, and it's funny. Don at one point pulled out his phone. He says, I got to catch this. this is... So I prayed for him, and I said, do you see? And he goes, I, I see black shadows. And I said, okay, so let me pray again. Hey, Christ, you know, prayed more than once. We're not greater than our master. Don't ever get that chip that if Jesus went through something, you're not getting a shortcut. Okay? Because when you go through the fire is when you're refined. Some of you looking at that furnace, like, whoo, let somebody else go through the fire and tell me about the experience. <laughs> I ain't going through that one. But when you go through the fire, you get refined. So I prayed again, and he goes, I, I see now white, white shadows. And I said, okay, let's pray a third time. Prayed a third time. He said, I see clearly. I got so nervous, I prayed for him again. I go, you see clearly? Okay, well, let's go at this again. That's how nervous I got. I prayed for him again. Do you know why? Because we sometimes pray without expecting that the answer is going to come right there. Let's just be real. Why? Because we don't know that the answer already lives in us. Because the answer already came. The answer already produced over 2,000 years ago. So what you live today is on stuff that was already done. And when you can see that, then you can walk it. I love, I love that. I was taking a trip, trip recently, didn't have the funds for it. I was thanking God for the funds. Listen to me. This is why relationship is so important. There was a gentleman that someone said that that gentleman said something negative about me. And you know what I did? I called him to tell him, they said that you said this about me. He said, I did not say that about you. 
I said, but I am calling you to let you know that I am not affected by it at all. And if you did say it about me, I'm not affected by it at all. And I want to let you know that between you and me, there's nothing but forgiveness. We got through talking. He says, what are you doing next? He says, I'm going on this trip. He goes, what's the cost? I gave it to him. He says, I'm sending you the money right now, Western Union. I'm like, what? Forgiveness has a reward. That's why he fills us with grace and truth with the person of Jesus Christ so that we would walk in forgiveness. In forgiveness. I was at a meeting where they were praying for people who had not been healed for 20 years or greater from a car accident. And when they brought the people on stage, you know what's the first thing that he did? He said, have you forgiven the person in the other car that ran into you? One lady, I mean, in massive pain, you could see it in her face. And she said, no, I haven't. And he says, would you forgive that person right now? Because I'm going to show you the power of forgiveness. He said, I want you not to forgive her with your lips. I want you to forgive that other person with your heart. And it took this lady a moment, which meant that she was being honest about it. And you know what she did? She forgave that other person. He goes, now watch this. In Jesus' name, pain, go. Boom. I mean, she got hit like she got hit by a cannon. Knocked out on the floor. They had an interviewer on the floor. And the lady interviewer got hit with the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise God. How you, oh, 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 glory. How do you feel? It was, it was, I mean, it was comical. She's like, I feel better. Oh, are you 100%? Oh, oh, praise God. And, and the lady's like, I'm about 90%. Preacher said, pick her up. Picked her up. Boom. Hit her again. Now she was 110% okay. This woman had lived in pain all those years and got healed because what did she do? She forgave just as Christ had forgiven her. Guys, there's some of you hanging on to sicknesses because of your heart that's been hardened to somebody that hurt you deeply. And God wants a flow in forgiveness, but you, and he wants a flow in healing in your life, but God is such a gentleman. And one time I said, why don't you get in my business, God, in this area? He goes, I'm a gentleman. He said, I stand at the door and knock. If you don't open, I don't walk in. I went, oh, that's how that works. Because I'm thinking, I'm no gentleman. You know, I kind of just <laughs> barge it. But not God. He's such a perfect gentleman that that's the way he operates. I was ministering to a couple about them being healed. And I shared something with this young lady. And God says, tell her that I won't force myself on her because I never rape anyone. And I don't know why God gave me those words for her. But you know what she said? Thank you, Pastor, because I've been raped. And let me tell you, it's not good. It's good to know that he's gentle with me, that he'll wait on me. He'll wait for me to open my heart. He'll wait for me to invite him in. That's who he is. He's a gentleman. But once you invite him in, that grace and truth walks inside of you. I'm telling you, I see a crowd here. You're full of the grace and the truth of God because you're filled with God. He is your head, Christ. You are his body. And that's all I see. I'm just looking at you. And it's like some of you are getting some of this. Like for the first time, you're sitting there going, oh, that's how that works. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And as God is revealing his word, you're growing. Amen. So the only reason that grace was given was to restore our relationship back with him. God is a God of relationship. Christ wants to be trusted by you. You know, he said, let's go to the other side with the disciples, and then he put his head on the pillow. Do you know why Christ put his head on the pillow? Because he knew the power of speaking invisible words into visible he knew what he had just done. He had just spoken something. If that boat had gone underwater, an air bubble would have followed it down. It would have been the first submarine. Why? Because the word is respected by nature. The word is respected. When Jesus, when they woke him up finally, I don't know, he must have been in REM, okay? Because when they woke him up, he was not happy. 
Now you got to be in REM when waves are filling the boat and moving the boat back and forth. I don't know if y'all have ever been on a boat and it gets choppy, the water, and that boat starts doing this and your stomach starts doing, oh boy, you know. Jesus is asleep. Why? He trusted in his own word. What was in that boat with them? The word, the living word. In the beginning was the word. He knew who he was. He was sleeping. When Jesus woke up and he rebuked them, I thought he rebuked them because they didn't rebuke the wind. He talked to them about their faith. Your faith, where is it? And then later I realized he didn't rebuke them because they didn't rebuke the wind. He rebuked them because they didn't join him on the pillow. It wasn't what they can do, it's what his word did for them. It was going on the other side. You should have rested like I rested on my word. You know, some of us have the same word, and you'll see one Christian completely resting and the other one's all nervous. What happened? One believed the word that was given, the other one didn't. But when you get to rest in that word, you join Jesus on the pillow. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful because that's true faith. You trust the word of the one that cannot lie. I've heard this a couple of times. You know, Pastor, when you pray for people, you just say with so much assurance and authority. How could you be so sure? Because the one that gave the word cannot lie. That's right. He can, it just can't happen. His word will come to pass. So let's at least then believe it. Today, you are the open book. The Bible says today the open book is you. And as you believe that word and you walk out that word, you know what happens? People will see Jesus in you. Amen? Amen. 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 Again, and not that this is his message, but again, my friend Gregory Dickow, he says that grace is this. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is a person, people. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.